just what I mean You too, T, keep it clean You see my boy, he like gotta made it Gotta made it to YouTube, team keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video and another episode of NFL Questions from Subs, a series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to, and we answer it in a video just like this. This will be part two, featuring them boys from Baltimore, Be Down, Jake Luke, and Spencer. So shout out to them too for continuing to join me uh, for questions from subscribers. And if you ever want to be a part of NFL questions from subscribers, you can send me an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com. But for the patrons, the patrons, you can send it directly on Patreon. Without further ado, let's jump into part two with Spencer and Jake Lou. Oh, yeah. You see, I got the boss, baby. Next question came from my guy, Dylan. He said, hey, engraving and team, keep it clean. Hope all is well and everybody has been getting through the offseason well. In previous emails, I speak a lot about the defense and how much I love uh, and critique certain things. However, this time it's about the offense. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Lamar, and I'm not trying to create excuses in advance for Lamar. He is our leader and our team spirit. But I'm looking at Greg Roman. Here's a few reasons why, just to be nice. Number one, we have brought in Sammy Watkins. Now, is this a flashy signing? No, of course not. But Sammy had his best production season under Greg Roman in his time at Buffalo. Number two, the drafting of Rashad Bateman. This is someone who can be our eventual number one in the future because we didn't get Julio Jones. <laughs> number three, number three, uh, there's Bryant's uh, Lamar video throwing fades. We have now been given actual video evidence of Lamar performing these throws. Let's start incorporating this and other throws as well. Number four, Hollywood, Duvernay, Prochet, speed, need I say more? Well, I think for the first two, for Prochet, I don't really get the speed. But anyway, number five, Boykin, six foot five. Let's throw a fade. Even if it's contested, give him some confidence. Number six, last but not least, I don't know, the best running attack in the league. I didn't even mention Mark Andrews as well until this right here right now. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand the players themselves have to execute plays and make things happen. I also acknowledge that outside of Baltimore fandom, that these names aren't household or even considered big time. But... For an offensive coordinator with a lot of weapons to work with, there is absolutely no reason for us not to be getting 25 to 30 points roughly each week on average. Yes, Lamar will be getting a payday and there will be expectations of him. But the more we play our game and stay to it, the better. So what are your thoughts? And sorry for keeping you a bit there. Regards, Dylan C. So oof, this is definitely a, uh, a loaded question. So uh, what, I, what, I, what I got from it that he's asking, like, looks like he feels like there's no excuses uh, for Greg Roman. H how do y'all feel about Greg Roman heading into this season moving forward? I had kind of always talked about how um, he certainly deserves criticism for some of the lack of creativity that people have talked about in the passing game, all the route concepts talk and all that kind of stuff. But I generally kind of thought he got a little too much hate because I think everyone sort of glommed on to the dead last in passing yards equals worst passing offense in the league. That's actually not true. They were probably about, you know, mediocre halfway in the league in terms of efficiency, which is kind of what I was always pointing at. So for, you know, first things first, I always had thought he got a little bit too much hate, but I also kind of pointed a little bit at the personnel and it's not to throw shade too much at Hollywood Brown or miles Boykin or any of these guys, but it just felt mm -hmm. like there was a, a little bit of square peg round hole situation going on with some of them where, I talked a little bit about this in an article for Baltimore Beatdown recently where Hollywood Brown was maybe playing a little bit too much X receiver or what would be equivalent to X receiver, which is mean, means he's susceptible to getting pressed on the line of scrimmage, can't go in motion. A lot of different stuff that a type of player of his profile, you know, that would not necessarily behoove him having success. So him moving a little bit more to Z receiver now with Watkins and Bateman. That's going to not only is the presence of Watkins and Bateman good because they're both talented players in their own right, but it's going to open up other things for Hollywood to be able to do, for Mark Andrews to be able to do, for all these guys. Josh Oliver showing up a little bit as that number three tight end, hopefully this year. Uh, it's just going to open up a lot of different things, and it's, it's due to the, uh, the talent they have at pass catcher. So I think, uh, I think Greg Roman's in for a little bit of a rebound in more ways than one this year. Okay. I like it. Yeah, Greg Roman definitely focuses on efficiency above all else. And, you know, there was a part in that question that was talking about throwing up some some jump balls to Miles Boykin, and we've seen what, you know, the practice footage. So that's that's something that I think gets a little misconstrued because 
if you're running a one-on-one, -on -one, where's the ball going to go? To the receiver who's running the route. There's only one option. You know, you're not, not going to throw it away. You're not going to scramble. It's not going elsewhere. So the ball is going to get put there. However, Greg Roman, when he was promoted to offensive coordinator, Greg Roman, in a litany of press conferences, talks about passing efficiency. And to him, that's red zone touchdown percentage. That's the QBR. That's the, you know, total amount of uh, passes that were completed on third down, the amount of conversions completed on third down, third down conversion rate. All of those are key factors. And if you want to go look at contested catch targets, let's let's talk about, you know, the guys who are best at contested catches or what pro football focus had as contested catches last year. There's about 20, 21, 20, pardon me, 22 receivers. Two of them were tied for 21st, DK Metcalf and DeAndre Hopkins, who caught at least 50% of their contested targets. Contested targets aren't effective. Throw it, you want to get someone open. You want to throw it to the open man. You don't want to throw it where a defender has a shot. Uh, Ken Miles Boy can make those plays. Would I have loved to see him have more of those jump ball, contested catch, go dunk on guy situations? Yes. But then you go back and look at games like Philadelphia from last year, I believe, you know, week six or seven, whatever it is. They tried to run one. He was blocking. You know, they tried to throw him the ball. He's in the end. He's, he's one. He, Lamar throws him up a, a 20 yard, you know, red zone fade. He's trying to block his corner because he doesn't know what the play is. I don't know if I've ever seen a receiver kind of take so much public criticism take it in stride, admit fault, have David Culley, the receivers coach, blame it on him, have Greg Roman kind of blame it on him a little bit, and he took it. So to me, that says it was his fault, and that is a, a microcosm, a little sample of what it's like to have a second-year receiver in Miles Boykin, a second-year receiver who came off of a foot injury, had no preseason, no real training camp, the first year, the second year, no preseason due to COVID in Marquise Brown. You've got Devin Duvernay, James Prochet, guys who came from spread, very college-style offenses, maybe more similar to, let's say, what the Bills run in Buffalo with Josh Allen, and now you're trying to insert them into an offense that uses motion more than any other team in the NFL. And that's a lot to take in. People ask why Devin Duvernay wasn't on the field more. Well, Devin Duvernay actually had three illegal formations in four games because he wasn't covering up the tackle because, you know, the litany of reasons. One of those I do blame on Greg Roman, which is sidetracking a little but not getting to the line quick enough, get, taking too long to get plays in, things like that. So there are things you can definitely blame on Greg Roman. But at the same time, I think Hollywood Brown put it best. I've, I've circulated this on Twitter a couple times. A reporter asked him a few days ago, has the scheme changed? And he said, no, the plays are all there. It's up to us as the receiving core to prove to Greg Roman that, we can execute these plays in practice so that way he feels confident to run them. And I think that is the best way to put it in terms of the passing game. And then we're not even going to talk about the injuries of the offensive line last year, losing Marshall Yonda, kind of missing Hayden Hurst a little bit, especially after Nick Boyle goes down. That ends up being like a, you know, a, a major hindsight. Man, I really wish we had Hayden Hurst when Nick Boyle goes down. But mm -hmm. hey, you know, Nick Boyle might not go down if you keep Hayden Hurst through the butterfly effect. But, you know, Greg Roman's not absolved of criticism. He definitely has his weaknesses. I think, you know, Bill Belichick has his weaknesses. You know, Joe Namath had his weaknesses. Johnny Unley, whoever, Tom Landry, Don Shul, everybody has their weaknesses as a coach, as a player, as a person. But I think he deserves a little bit more credit than he gets for an offense that's led the NFL in points over the last two years. The next question came from my guy Schlubs. He said, hey, I'm sorry to hear about uh, Mike's loss of his aunt and uncle. It's tough losing family. I also had a rough year, but losing family makes it all that much worse. Uh, but I was actually blessed with a new baby sister yesterday morning, uh, so I'm happy. I'm 16 years older, but I feel the pain of Mike. Um, but he said, my question is, now that, oh, congr congrats on your little sister, too. Uh, he said, now that we just got Justin Houston, are the Ravens a complete team? Uh, I'm done with all this drama. The Ravens are pursuing this guy and that guy. Let's just start and play some football already. So, and he said, love the viz and keep up the great work. Sorry for such a long email. Trust me, that email was not long at all, especially compared to stuff that we got before. So... Are the Ravens a complete team? I yeah. Think so. Yes. I, I would say yes, um, especially now. And uh, I don't know if he was alluding to the uh, Justin Houston situation there with uh, part of what he said as to them pursuing guys or not pursuing guys and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it did feel like, you know, as much as they're not the best position in the league at a lot of spots on the roster, they're certainly not even close to the worst position in the league on, uh, you know, pretty much anywhere on the roster. I think uh, they're in a really good spot, obviously, at the quarterback position. Wide receiver, they're in a pretty decent spot, especially relative to where they usually are. Tight end is a strength. Running back, big right. strength. 
offensive line, if nothing else, I think is going to be solid. And then you look at the other side of the ball and uh, front seven, adding Justin Houston helps a lot. There might be some growing pains losing Judon and Ngakwe, but you got a lot of good pieces there. Young, promising linebackers. You got some good veteran linebacking presence there too with a guy in uh, LJ Fort. And then secondary is going to be a strength as well. And then best kicker in the league. I mean, what's what's not to like here? I've got a little bit of a barking dog here, so bear with me. But ultimately, you talk about players, that's one that's aspect one of it. Of then you're going to go look at the coaching staff. You've got your coordinators back. You've got coordinators that you're pretty confident in. And overall, a lot of you know fans have some gripes with Greg Roman. That's fine. But having that continuity is something Ravens fans begged for for Joe Flacco, having the same offensive mm-hmm. coordinator for a couple of years. Uh, it's something that was begged for quite a few times throughout the, the history of the Baltimore Ravens, dating back to the 90s when coaches get poached when you're a good organization. Then the other aspect of that is bringing in Keith Williams, replacing some guys, bringing in Anthony Weaver, a former Raven, a former defensive coordinator for the Texans. And some people, you know, oh, the Texans had the worst defense in the league last year. Well, guess what Wink Martindale's defense was when he was a defensive coordinator for one year in Denver, 32nd in points, 31st in yards, all that good stuff. So sometimes the coach is not the result or the, the results are not fully the capacity of the coach, but sometimes it's the personnel and it goes the other way as well. So then you talk about Eric DaCosta being frugal in the right places, trying to show that, Hey, if we draft you, you work your tail off here and you play through your first four years, you have a good attitude, you show up and you stay, you know, relatively healthy. Or even if you just work hard through injury, guys like Ladarius Webb, but now it's Lamar Jackson, guys like Mark Andrews, guys like Marlon Humphrey and Ronnie Stanley, what organization would you rather go to if you're being drafted? No, you don't have a choice, but would you rather go to the organization that's known for paying guys that they draft? Or would you rather go to the organization who, you know, you look at the Bengals, a lot of times have some great players that they can't end up affording or the competitive draw isn't quite there. You know, a guy like Joe Tooney, they really wanted in Cincinnati and they couldn't get him. He went to the Chiefs. I, I believe that the Bengals offered, you know, a pretty similar offer, making him one of the highest paid offensive linemen in the NFL. But, you know, they don't have the competitive balance. They don't have the winning organization, and the Ravens have all of that. So player per player, coaching staff, and front office-wise, you know, the Ravens are rock solid. And the next question came from my guy, Josh HW. And similar to the previous question, but a little bit different, he said, hey, Graven, with all the Ravens transactions so far this offseason, do you think that this team is overall better than last year's? I, I'll start this one off. I, I think um, they certainly can be better than last year. Uh, and for me, it starts with the offensive line, uh, offensive line and the health of the offensive line, in my opinion. Um, and also, even if you back up before that, last year, the offseason that it was, or really the offseason that it wasn't, Uh, They have an actual offseason this year. So I think that just makes a big difference with every single person on the roster, every single coach, every single just everything. Having an offseason, being able to implement new ideas into the offense, defense, special teams, everything, Um, just being able to have the the, the reps, the practice, uh, the build the chemistry in the offseason, that makes a big difference to hit stride in a regular season. So I certainly think they can be better uh, this year than they were last year. What about you? I think so too. I think I'm uh, the closer we get to the season, the more bullish I'm feeling, I think. And uh, maybe that's just something that always happens where the closer you get as a fan, you know, I'm still a fan at heart. The, uh, the, the more you kind of want the, uh, want the picture to be painted in your head of them uh, doing all the things that you dream of them doing. But I don't know, man, like I think if they're going to lean a little bit more on offense this season and particularly the passing attack, uh, they, they showed it with their actions with, going out and getting the guys that they got who, you know, again, I'm bullish on Rashad Bateman. I was preaching it pretty much from the beginning of the draft process that he was a guy. They go and get him. I love Tylen Wallace as well. We'll see if he works his way into the uh, into that receiving rotation at some point. You got Mark Andrews returning. Offensive line, like I said, is going to be solid. So I think uh, if you're winning on the – or leaning on the offense to win a couple more track meets this year and the defense is going to be – kind of almost as good, maybe not quite to the heights of uh, last year's. I think that's a, a recipe for a more balanced team, and I think uh, that could ultimately be a better team. And it depends like depends on how you define better, like if that's advancing in another round of the playoffs. Like I certainly think they could go to the AFC championship game. So, you know, I would say, yeah, they certainly could be better. I think that you see a team that had relied on guys like Marquise Brown, Patrick Queen, uh, Deshaun Elliott, Jimmy Smith, who's on the back end a little bit more of his career a ton. And uh, looking around this this kind of roster, Bradley Bozeman, who was, had a couple of years under his belt, not necessarily as a starter. I think he 
didn't start until a playoff game as rookie season. Uh, but, but relying on some of these younger players and adding on to this roster, as well as watching those young players get notches on their belt and gain experience and situational experience and fall short of goals. And we actually got the chance to interview Ed Reed uh, quite a few months ago. I think it was actually prior to the Super Bowl. And I asked Ed a question that I thought he, he might have a little bit more of a uh, colorful answer to. I asked him, Ed, you know, do you feel like this team kind of reminds you of those, you know, 2008, 2010, 2009 Ravens that were just kept falling right short of their goal? And he said, no, man, they remind me of early in my career when we didn't have it all together and we had a good organization and good teams, but we weren't as close as we thought we were. Mm-hmm. And I think that they're kind of at the brink now of moving through the way that they can describe that into being a team that can consistently really compete for a Super Bowl. And that means being able to throw the ball, being able to run the ball, being able to defend the pass, being able to get pressure, being able to stop the run, being great on special teams, being consistent week in and week out. The one area I think that the Ravens are lacking and are still youthful is in, and and this is kind of big brain, but in the minute to minute, day to day, nitty gritty details. And I think that we've seen a team that was, you know, has talked about Super Bowls a lot, but hasn't been as close as they feel like they are and maybe aren't quite as close. So I think starting to appreciate the grind is something that this younger, still kind of younger, but a little more veteran with some additions, but still younger team needs to work through and embrace the grind. And you again, talking about Ed Reed, his Hall of Fame speech, where he talks about seeing grown men throwing their towels on the floor so that other grown men who are volunteer firefighters can come in and clean up after them. He said, that's the kind of stuff we can't be doing. Those are the details that matter all the way down to that microscopic level. You have to be that focused and that detailed to be a champion in this incredibly beautiful, but violent sport that has it's, I mean, it's a practice sport. You have to be perfect or striving to be minute to minute Mm -hmm. day. So I think that that is where this team still falls short. I think that, They'll get there in, you know, a couple of years and, and Hey, you know, teams can make runs. We saw that, but I think they still need a little bit more prime players and veteran players. But I think the areas where they're relying on, uh, you know, a jump is like linebacker and uh, you know, kind of your depth receivers and, and some positions that aren't quite as important in today's game. So I think they're in a good place, but they're not quite all the way there yet. Oh, the last question on this episode came from my guy D3. He said, good morning, engraving and team. Keep it clean. Hope all is well with you and the fam. All is good here in the DMV, and I look forward to seeing the birds of prey tomorrow at the bank for the training camp. Well, y'all know when this was then. He said, I would like your input on something that I'm sure Ravens will have to address sooner rather than later. This offseason, the Buccaneers were able to re-sign all of their players from last year's Super Bowl winning team. This normally doesn't happen, and in the past, many Super Bowl teams have been depleted, either by assistant coaches leaving for head coaching spots, players getting traded for better pay, or players retiring. My question to you is, if the Ravens win a Super Bowl this year, Hopefully we can have this conversation. But as we hope they will, what positions on offense and defense do you see the 2022 Ravens having to address the most, and would it be better to fill those positions via the draft or trade? Again, thank you for all the content and your tireless consistency in keeping us informed. Stay safe, big homie, and may your platform continue to grow. Appreciate it, D3. That's a really good question. So if they win the Super Bowl, which positions do you see them needing to address, and would it be better better for them to address it via the draft or free agency? Hmm. I'd say the defensive line, you got Calais Campbell, Derek Wolf, Brandon Williams, all into their thirties, as well as Justin Ellis, who's in his thirties behind that. You got two second year guys in Justin Matabuike and uh, Broderick Washington, who, you know, look promising. I think Broderick Washington look, looks like he could potentially be a nice depth piece, a nice rotational guy. And he was a late round draft pick. He, he might be a little out of funk in the Raven system, but, and Matabuike looks like, a guy who has, you know, pro bowl, maybe even all pro potential and his athleticism and his hustle and all that good stuff. But I'm going to start there and say that that is definitely going to be an area of concern. If the Ravens win a Super Bowl, you got to think Clayus Campbell says sayonara uh, and sails off into the sunset. Brandon Williams is in the last year of his contract. And, you know, that uh, I feel like he might have a couple more years of ball left in him. We'll, we'll see where he ends up. But after a Super Bowl, you never know. And I think that's the one area on this entire roster where you're looking next year and you're saying, uh oh, you know, there's some some major ramifications that they're going to have to deal with. And in terms of where they saw, they do that, I think you need to go both draft and free agency. I think you're going to have to double hit that and make sure that you've got guys that allow you to run those nickel and dime defenses. If you don't have defensive tackles that can hold ground and occupy space, 
then you're not able to run nickel and dime as confidently. You've got to put linebackers on the field to go deal with it or else your defensive game plan is going to fall apart consistently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're going to want to also get a look at Jawan James at right tackle, but let's say that doesn't work out, then that's going to be a position where – and even if, you know, let's say they do win the Super Bowl and they decide to move on from Alejandro Villanueva, who obviously is going to be starting there at right tackle this year, they brought James in sort of as that future move kind of behind him. But, you know, let's say they do move on from Villanueva, even if they do have James coming into the picture and starting there at right tackle in 2022, they're probably still going to want to get another young guy in there just in the event that maybe it doesn't work out or maybe he prices himself out of uh, what they originally gave him and they're going to be need to looking for a replacement there. So I think just some spots along the offensive line. Obviously, they drafted Cleveland. They got Bozeman kicking into center. Kevin Zeitler was going to be at right guard for the uh, near future at the very least. Uh, maybe just right tackle is what I would be looking at personally. All right, cool. Hey, man, I appreciate y'all coming on big time, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, for real. Because I, I could have easily found some more questions and kept this thing going, man. So uh, I appreciate y'all a lot, man. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We appreciate it. We'd love to have you on our show sometime soon, hopefully uh, before the season starts here and get all that good stuff going. And hopefully uh, we continue to see your platform grow. And uh, you can tell through those emails how much your listeners and your audience really enjoys your content. So we appreciate you bringing us on majorly. You said thank you seven times. I'll say it eight. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it nine. Uh, thanks uh, for having us on and helping us kind of, uh, you know, put our name out there to your great listeners. And uh, hopefully we'll get you on and we can do the uh, extend the same favor to you. And I just want to say, keep up the great content, the uh, very prolific content, I'm making videos on uh, pretty much each and every single topic that uh, comes up about the Ravens. It's always fun to listen in every now and again. And uh, I think um, I love the positivity and uh, just the, uh, the good natured energy that you bring to uh, a space that can sometimes need it, frankly, in something like Twitter or YouTube, for example. So, uh, Thanks for having us on, man. And um, yeah, it's just a, a mutual admiration society here from us to you. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it, man.